dare you. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for uh, our July Conrack meeting. Um, obviously in a, a really great space, which we'll get to that in a moment. Um, I did want to say that we have a special surprise in store for all of you. Nicole's not even aware of this, but we're actually going to take this off the screen and we're all going to watch Twisters. Um, <laughs> they're bringing the popcorn, <laughs> special treat, and we'll just get back to Conrack in a couple months. <laughs> <laughs> my 12 year old self would just die for that. So. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, we'll have a number of thank yous, uh, for everything we got to experience the last couple of days in just a moment, but right off the bat, I wanted to welcome Erica Rogler from the Dietrich theater. Uh, we're very grateful to have this space today. As you can see, it's a real community asset and Erica is just going to talk a little bit about the theater. <laughs> As Silas said, I'm Erica Robler, the Executive Director of the Wyoming County Cultural Center, and we're so excited you could be with us today in our space. Um, in addition to showing movies, we also offer arts and education programming that includes nature and science programming, health and wellness programming for our community. Um, this past Saturday, we had Tintanic River Day, which the teacher hosts with our 19th year for that. But we are so glad that Nick and Amanda could be here for Ross Burnett and Mike from the Bureau of Forestry, as well as Jill from the Visitor Bureau. Um, so we love partners with those in the field of nature and science. So if you ever would like to partner with us, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, thank you. Uh, well, okay, there's the history nerd in me coming out. So what year was the... So the Dietrich was opened in 1937, and it thrived. The first weekend, 1,500 people came out to see the state of the art theater. So it thrived for about 50 years. And then in the 80s, the mall cineplexes were a huge thing. And um, they kind of killed the one screen theaters that the Dietrich originally was. And then in 1998, a group of volunteers sat around a kitchen table. They said, we think Titanic misses its theater. And we would love to bring it there. So uh, they formed a nonprofit and raised some money to reopen it. And they thought it would originally take $100,000 in six months. <laughs> but when they bought it, they could see the clouds roll by, or the ceilings, the roof should have been. And so it took a million dollars in three years. But their mission all along was to be more than the movies. So we're all seeing cultural stuff. Excellent. So thank thank you. you. Thanks so much. Yep. Good. Yeah, as in my day job, I work in economic development. We currently own a historic theater, and we're looking at maybe raising $15 million for that one. So, like, even a million dollars, I'm like, that's a bargain. That's awesome. Um, and it's really important to point out that, you know, this is one historic resource in the region of many, and that's why this is one of the state's uh, designated heritage areas. We're in the Endless Mountain heritage region. You might hear a little bit more about that and kind of the activities around cultural and heritage tourism and outdoor recreation tourism from Jill later in our agenda. Um, and Kane Chamberlain, who runs Endless Mountains Heritage Region, wasn't able to join us today, but I'm sure he would have liked to have been here. Um, they're an important partner and obviously a DC and e DCNR uh, funding partner as well. Um, so just a couple thank yous. Uh, we had a great day yesterday visiting Miller Mountain with Nick and the um, Bureau of Forestry team. So thank you for the drive up the mountain, the great view, um, giving us a sense for why that's such a special place um, and the work that was done around preserving it. Um, also to the Vosburg Neck State Park team um, for hosting us, not, not only for a hike and a paddle, but also for a great dinner um, in the barn last night. Um, and to, I know they're not here today, but the Endless Mountain Outfitters uh, for providing the paddle on the river. Um, just one of many businesses that are, you know, using our state park and our state forest land uh, for economic opportunity. Um, I also want to give a shout out and a round of applause to uh, the DCNR team, Nicole, Ara, for planning the logistics around the event. Thank you. We knew it was going to be a little hit or miss with the kayaking and the rain and everything, but it all turned out perfectly. So thanks for all the hard work. We know it's not easy taking the show on the road. Um, and obviously, I just want to reiterate why, why we're here. Um, this is a special region in terms of um, 
bringing together state parks, a brand new state park, a state forest district that continues to expand, um, an area where some of the legacy industries like forest products are still very active, but we're also seeing the outdoor recreation economy grow and grow um, as part of you know tourism and economic opportunity and small business growth. Um, so it's just a really great region that brings together a lot of things Conrack has been focused on in the last several years, has been trying to support and better understand um, through the work of the Office of Outdoor Recreation. Um, so again, thanks for making the time and effort to be here. I think we ha will have um, Meredith Graham joining us remotely, uh, but I think we had a really great in-person uh, participation this time as well. So uh, as we always do, we'll just go around before our public comment period and do a quick council uh, and audience introductions, just so you know who's in the room. Um, I probably, I don't know if I introduced myself, Silas Chamberlain. I work for the York County Economic Alliance down in South Central Pennsylvania uh, in economic development, and I chair CONRAC. So why don't we start with Marcus and work our way across? Yeah, no, no <laughs> Some could say that. Okay. Um, Not all of us. <laughs> oh, I thought you were talking about York for a second. Okay. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Uh, Bob Kirchner, I'm from uh, St. Mary, Pennsylvania. I'm a member of council. <laughs> I'm Jerry Wallace. I'm from the Williamsport area. Tired of bringing a trip to Michael. And uh, of kayaking. But I'm also active and green. I'm proud of rails. Very well. Bring all the five minutes to see in our policy office. I'm the environmental assessment for Mosberg Center. I'm Nick Lago. I'm the district forester for the Pinchot Forest District here local in Northeast Pennsylvania. Hi, it's Hughes with Pro Conservation. I'm the I'm a I'm a I'm a Nick Solder, Park Manager, Bosbury Tech State Park. Jason Zerman, Assistant Director for State Parks. All right. And Meredith, if you can hear us, do you want to unmute and introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Silas. Good morning. This is Meredith Graham. I'm the Vice Chair of Conrack. I'm calling from Washington County, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to make it in person. Well, thanks for joining us remotely, Meredith. Um, okay, well, thanks everybody. Uh, now we'll move on to our public comment period. I don't necessarily see any members of the public here. Have we received any comments? No, okay. So we will move on from that to approval of our prior meeting minutes. Council should have approved or should have received those minutes in your meeting packet. Um, are there- So moved. 
Okay. There's a motion. Is there a second? Marcus seconds. Uh, all those in favor of approving the meeting minutes from our last meeting say aye. Any opposed? Okay, our minutes are approved. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to provide a very brief council report and then um, I'll turn it over to Nicole for much more detail on some uh, policy and DCNR updates. Uh, just two logistical things before we get started. Um, I think on our agenda, when we sent it out originally, it showed us having lunch here at the theater following the meeting um, and then sticking around till about 1.30 on the agenda. I think the reality is, you know, we'll, we'll wrap up this public meeting around noon. We'll have lunch. If there's anything anybody has that's, you know, of timely importance, we can certainly discuss it over lunch. But otherwise, we'll just have lunch together and then people can hit the road and start traveling back because I know some of you uh, have quite a way to go today. Um, and we've had a busy last two days. So um, we'll just have lunch and then hit the road. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is just a slight change to our agenda formatting. Uh, we had previously had our work group updates as one of the last items on the agenda, and they came late in the meeting. Um, you'll notice that they're not on there this time. That doesn't mean that we don't want to hear updates from our work groups, but in the future, we'll incorporate that into the council report portion of the agenda so that they're up front. That way, if there's any timely, timely updates from work groups, we're getting it on there uh, instead of two hours deep in the meeting so that if there's members of the public tuning in, they're getting those work group updates as well. Um, so I will in a moment ask if, if anybody has any timely updates they'd want to share during the public portion of the meeting. Um, but otherwise, in the future, we'll just anticipate them there. Um, the, the two things I wanted to mention, one is just obviously we have a new state budget. Um, wanted to thank the legislature and the governor's office for for moving that budget. I'm sure Nicole uh, will have a little more detail to offer on that. Um, but obviously, there's some significant investments in DCNR um, and some of the sister agencies that are related to um, open space, environmental stewardship, um, clean streams. So there's a lot of good things in the budget. Um, but um, we'll get a little bit more of an update on that in a moment. Um, and because our we have a work group that's been talking about issues about trail maintenance um, and trails in general. I wanted to note that DCNR is currently circulating um, a trail partner survey to solicit input, not from the general public on trail maintenance and trail management, but from the folks that actually manage trails um, and deal with those logistical issues on the front lines. Um, I'll forward that survey out to the con full conrack please don't take it unless you're a trail manager but if you know trail partners in your region who are managing trails that are dealing with some of the maintenance issues and stewardship issues that we've spoken a lot about at conrack encourage them to complete it that survey uh, finding will then be incorporated into the update to the trail or the state trail plan um, that you know will hopefully provide a framework for the next five years of trails and in Pennsylvania. Obviously, the Pennsylvania Trails Advisory Council is, you know, playing a lead role in that work, but we can also help get the word out to complete that trail partner survey. Um, and I think that's it. So I'm going to kick off with just a quick update from uh, the economic contrib. Oh, Janet, go ahead. Yeah. Other uh, venues and opportunities and things that are already doing up in the endless mountains. And at the end of that summit, so it's the 18th, 19th, and 20th. And then that Saturday, endless mountains here in the region. I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, Joel. Is hosting a round of bike ride. So um, it's a good opportunity to spend some time up in. Uh, Great, good plug. Just a follow-up question on the summit. Are there any highly accomplished experts that are speaking on any panels during? Oh, okay. Uh, called my bluff on that one. I was referring to Sierra. Well, <laughs> 18th is a conference. There's an opportunity to come up and do another panel. And we're meeting at the Hill. 
And then the, the coffee match starts at 19 to 19 to 19. Then the 21st is uh, and it's not so we just have all day left. No, that was great. Thank you. Um, so uh, just on the economic contribution side, as we have in the past, we're really deferring to Nathan's work with the Office of Outdoor Recreation. Uh, their big focus in the last couple months has been uh, contracting for a feasibility study business plan for the Outdoor Business Alliance that's been proposed by Governor Shapiro that will function as almost like a chamber of commerce for the outdoor industry in Pennsylvania. Um, right now, there's no sort of framework for bringing together all the different businesses that are part of the outdoor sector. Um, that's what this OBA would do. So for the next nine, 10 months or so, uh, DCNR will be participating in that process. Nathan will be helping to lead a steering committee through that process to get input from different people that would be members of that group. Um, look how it aligns with other organizations that are also bringing industry groups together, evaluating models from other states and trying to figure out what has worked well, what hasn't, uh, what model would you know work best here in Pennsylvania. And there's a lot of logistical issues, as you can imagine, around that of you know what kind of membership looks like, what advocacy looks like for a group like that. So this will be a really good process to just work through all those issues. At the end of it will hopefully be, you know, a model that then Conrack and other groups can help support by bringing the outdoor industry together through it. So again, um, I don't know that there's a need for our work group to do a whole lot in the moment, but as that process goes forward and there's more public outreach around it and meetings can certainly engage Conrack in that. Um, and ultimately, there'll be you know some some things for us to review. I'm sure. And Nathan, when do you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and Fourth Economy. Some of you might be familiar with Fourth Economy. They're based in Pittsburgh. Um, really great, you know, economic planning, um, ac economic analytics company is the lead consultant on that. So if you do see someone reaching out, it could be Fourth Economy as well. Um, just because he's in the front row, uh, Marcus, any updates uh, just on your work group with um, equitable access? Uh, the biggest thing is the first recreational engagement session that was spearheaded by Arlene, Brandon Hoover, and uh, Greg for making a certain perspective in Pittsburgh was accomplished two weeks ago. A lot of positive feedback on underrepresented community members, specifically black and brown folks business owners, tangential recreation users coming into the space providing feedback on the sport plan. Uh, really happy, proud, excited to see all the development that has occurred in that space. So Philadelphia's up next, I no, believe. Uh, and then another engagement session in Harrisburg as well. So uh, continuing to support there with contacts in any way that you know can be a partner and uh, hopefully Getting the right people in the room at the right time. So that's the update from us. Uh, the sport. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Meredith, do you have any update from your work group? I do not have a specific update. We're uh, in a place of just waiting for strategic planning documents to become available for comment. Right. Okay. Thank you. And Bob, I can't remember if you had a meeting or if that one was canceled. But... Yeah, we did not have a meeting in the uh, beginning of July. We, we continue to look forward to Conrad's possible participation in the public outreach. Uh, did the effort to set up an authority in the north central ATV riding area? And uh, looking forward to this maintenance report because that was one of our charges as well. It's always nice when someone starts to do the work you thought you're going to have to do. Right? <laughs> Doesn't always work out like that. <laughs> uh, and did I? I don't think I missed any working groups. Did I? I don't see any. Oh, that's right. Uh, from yeah, probably not. Okay. Okay. Great. All right, so I think that's it for our work group updates. Obviously, again, over lunch, we can talk in any more detail if, if any of the groups have anything pressing. Uh, with that, I think I'll just turn it over to Nicole for the department update. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again. I uh, just want to echo Silas's 
thank you coming all the way here. Some of you traveled very, very far. Um, so hopefully you felt it was worthwhile. Um, and, you know, thank you to our team for just being so welcoming and supportive and, and helping us uh, through all of this. So um, I don't have a ton of comments here. I will just say Secretary Dunn sends her regrets. She is enjoying a very well-deserved vacation and uh, spending time, lots of time outdoors. Uh, so, and we know that she um, is here in spirit and certainly was here in spirit on our kayak trip. <laughs> um, so uh, just some budget updates. You have all um, probably have seen some of the media coverage um, in recent weeks. Uh, Governor Josh Shapiro signed a $47.6 billion bipartisan budget package um, that represents about a 6.2% increase in spending over the previous budget. Uh, thankfully, the budget um, really provides DCNR with some uh, additional funds that we requested to meet some of our operational needs uh, and to support the work uh, that we do on behalf of Pennsylvanians. DCNR in particular um, will receive $5 million, uh, and uh, that includes five new complement positions to expand the Pennsylvania Outdoor Corps uh, through investments from the Reemployment Fund, uh, which is a program administered through the Pennsylvania uh, Department of Labor and Industry. This program has helped over 1,100 young Pennsylvanians, um, our future conservation leaders, uh, develop skills by completing uh, critical projects in state parks and forests. Uh, as you, if you haven't had an opportunity uh, to connect with the Outdoor Corps, I strongly encourage you to. Um, and that's maybe something that we can think of as a con, maybe as a Conrad um, trip in the future. Uh, it's really a model workforce development program that serves um, as a critical recruitment uh, tool. Uh, and training pipeline, not just for government agencies like DCNR and Fish and Boat Game Commission, but you know for those you know private sector industries as well that mm -hmm. complement the work that we do, both on the conference conservation side and and restoration work. There really is an unprecedented need uh, for skilled workers in Pennsylvania when it comes to addressing climate change and advancing conservation, recreation, environmental um, restoration projects, et cetera. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the additional funding that Pennsylvania and other states are receiving and competing for uh, when it comes to uh, this particular work. The, the boost in funding, particularly for the Outdoor Corps, will allow us to build regional capacity and really help support communities and some of the work and needs that they may have. So we're really excited about that. The governor's budget also included an additional $500,000 per um, annual uh, to the Keystone Tree Fund um, to, to help us um, in our efforts to plant trees, um, support our buffer restoration work, um, climate resiliency, and then another $1.5 million to advance our spongy moth spraying program, which, as we know, um, is really important as well. And we saw some of the impact of the spongy moth even on our tour. Uh, I also know that, note that in this budget, we also, there was uh, an, an increase in payment of lieu, payment in lieu of taxes. Um, on state lands managed by DCNR, Game Commission, and Fish and Boat Commission. Um, this is the PILT that many of you may be familiar with. So under the, the budget, under the legislation that passed, each of the three agencies would pay $9 per acre split evenly among the county, municipality, and school district, and that's an increase of about $1.80 over the current rate. Um, so the increase will be funded in part, in, in part through DCNR and through the gaming fund. Um, we are also excited to welcome Ryan uh, Zook, Zook um, as our new CONREC administrator. Um, you may, some of you may know Ryan because he used to work for DCNR. He has a conservation background. So Ryan will be supporting the council uh, behind the scenes and taking up some key responsibilities, including communications, scheduling meetings, um, and helping us, uh, helping the work groups. Uh, just again, just want to thank our regional staff, um, Christine Tour, Nick Lilo, uh, Nick Solzer, their teams 
um, as well as Morgan Algrove Hodges and Ara Vench um, in the central office for helping to organize this tour and get all of the details um, uh, sussed up and for us to have a successful event. And thanks, special thanks to our regional staff for getting the weather to cooperate. I knew that you had to put some extra. What's that? And, and the wildlife, yes, because we did see quite a bit of, of uh, we saw a number of bald eagles, we saw some heron, um, pretty impressive. Deer. Some, a lot of deer, yeah, that's that's true. Just reinforces our, uh, some of the work that we're doing on that as well. Um, also want to thank um, the Endless Mountains Visitors Bureau um, and the Dietrich Theater for being so accommodating and, and, uh, and welcoming, so thank you for that. Uh, and just on the policy front, so we are going to be fi uh, finalizing the ATV policy. So thank you um, to Conrad for providing uh, some additional feedback and con uh, uh, comments on that. Um, we also received some comments from PTAC, Pennsylvania Trail Advisory Council, the Next Gen Advisory Council, the Sportsman's Advisory Council. And so all of that will be kind of integrated and um, finalized into the policy. And then I believe the next meeting will be talking a little bit more about our suite of sustainability policies. So I'll dive into that a little bit more at that next meeting. And that is all I have um, and happy to take any questions. Questions, but thanks. You received an email that they are looking for project allocations that I'll go for and your two August studies. And we do projects with community partners on a cost share basis. So if anyone is interested, I imagine you're going to thank you. Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's great. Thank you. And also note that the Next Gen Council is also looking for members. And I know Ali Bowling, who is our coordinator for the council, is on the meeting. So maybe she can just provide a link. Um, so if you know anyone who might be interested in that, uh, you can you can share that. So, all right. Yeah. Um, you could Ryan just introduce himself? Yes. On the council and the, sure. for those listening in because. I think we really lucked out with securing Brian uh, because of his background for sure. and the work he's doing now. So Ryan, do you mind giving like your your three minute uh, spiel <laughs> on your background? Maybe you want to do it up at the mic this time. Yeah. yeah. Is there any other questions for me before I, I can sit down? Go ahead, Marcus. I have a question. I know that the assessment for the PA Outdoors were wrapped up last year, I think, for August 2023. Uh, there's now obviously allocations for a little bit of growth with outward work. Is there any like final document that we can view in regards to recommendations or revisions to the so work? they are still finalizing their strategic plan. They okay. hope to do that by August or September. And my hope is, and maybe that's something that we can um, have them come, especially with this new investment, come and speak to uh, council and provide an update um, and get some uh, feedback from council as well. But yes. Um, it's not quite finalized, but it's getting there. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Jerry. Are, have there been any changes or, or what are the general criteria for projects for the outdoor? So we're still trying to kind of flush that out. So the funding does allow us to have some potentially more flexibility. So that could mean, so right now we have a match requirement, for example, for partner organizations. There might be opportunities to lessen that match, um, particularly for under-resourced or underserved communities. So that's something that we're working through. I these are this is just us kind of having conversations, but through that strategic plan is, is where some of these conversations are having uh, are are being um, uh, worked through. Trail development. Yes, absolutely. And trails. Yes. So um, as some of you may have remembered, there was a trail ask in the budget, um, particularly for state park and forest uh, trail systems. We did not get that. Um, so there may be opportunities where the outdoor core can help complement some of the need. That need did not go away. And so we want to you know, continue the conversation. We know we have a governor who has a really strong interest and understanding of the, the value of trails. Um, and so that conversation is going to continue, certainly. But we do see the outdoor core potentially providing some additional resources along the way, as they have been. Um, but this additional capacity could really help boost that. Any other questions? Okay, Ryan. Uh, 
Hi, Ryan Such. Uh, yeah, I'm the new Conrack administrator as of July 1st, and I'll just give a bit of background about myself. Uh, I grew up in the Pittsburgh area, moved around a bit to some other states, but now live in Northern New York County. And um, early in my career, worked as an environmental consultant, mainly doing uh, land use permitting, restoration, and environmental liability work. Uh, then worked as a contractor a while for the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service before finding my way to the Commonwealth and working in DCNR for 12 years uh, in the Bureau of Forestry. And when I first came in, uh, kind of stood up the water quality monitoring program for the shale gas monitoring team for a couple of years. But most of the time I was in the planning section of the Bureau of Forestry uh, for eight years as its leader. And that section's primary responsibilities are strategy and policy development uh, worked on like the state forest resource management plan and the various district level management plans. Uh, also manage the land conservation program. So adding land to the state forest system and manage the sustainability certification. So the uh, state forest systems third party certified as sustainably managed. We manage that program and uh, I left the the Commonwealth in March of 2023 worked for a short time with a stream and wetland restoration company that did mitigation banking. And then in February, founded my own company, Grow Conservation, that's uh, aiming to do a combination of like conservation technical services to the conservation community and management consulting type services and strategic planning and stakeholder engagement. And so I was very excited to receive my first state contract, which is uh, to be the Conrack administrator here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. So if you're having an issue with Teams <laughs> or uh, setting a cat, sending a calendar invitation for your work group, we now have an extra person to help you with that, which is always good. Plus, we he happens to also be an expert in this work. So icing on the cake. Thanks, Ryan. Um, wanted to also just give a shout out. I see David Mayer is on. Um, I, David spoke with uh, Conrack maybe last year. He's the DCNR's coordinator of the State Heritage Program, Heritage Area Program. Um, and because we're in the Mountains Heritage Region, just wanted to note David's on and doing great work across the state with our heritage areas. Uh, okay, now moving on to DCNR's legislative report. Uh, Eric Nelson's joining us remotely. Good morning, everyone. I'll just give a quick morning. Uh, Nicole. Nicole uh, kind of ran through the budget um, uh, updates, but I'll just I'll just mention that um, we are planning a tour of the Delaware Canal State Park with the caucus um, sometime in September. So that's going to be um, in September, and then we're going to do also a tour of the Susquehanna Riverland State Park um, in. October with uh, the House Tourism Committee. Um, so those are just two updates I just wanted to share that are on the horizon, um, which I thought are, you know, going to be fun and interesting. Um, and that's it. That's all I really got right now. So enjoy your summer. Um, any questions? I guess we're and we're entering a lull period here, right, yeah. Eric, for uh, legislative action? Yes. Eric, yes. Uh, you mentioned the that's when Riverlands store. Would you be a little more specific on the geography of that? We're still we're still Did working it out right now. Um, we're still working it out right now, but it sounds like it's going to be the first week of October. So it's going to be um, on a Wednesday and Thursday because I think they're in session the first week of October. So we're hoping to plan it um, that Wednesday and Thursday. Let me just see what date that would be. October 3rd and 4th is what we're looking at right now. And Eric, do you mean uh, Susquehanna Riverland State Park or the, or do you mean like the region broadly? The park. Yeah. Okay. The, so that's the park. Yeah. So Jerry, we're, that's the one that's in Northeastern York County. Yep. And we're working out the details right now, but it's going to be with the House Tourism Committee. Great. Any other questions for Eric? All right. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Uh, I don't believe we have any council business. 
but someone can correct me if I'm wrong. So we'll just move on to uh, the update on DCNR's new state parks with Jason Zimmerman. Thanks, Jason. Are you able to get our presentation or is it on this computer? Uh, 2020, the first one. Perfect. Yep. I think we're. Good. Is it sharing? OK, so my name is Jason Zarin. I am the assistant director of state parks. I oversee the field operations of our 124 state parks. Um, I also brought with two of the interns for the bureau out of the director's office this year. Um, wanted them to experience this and step outside their comfort zone a little bit. So we're going to go through and talk about mainly two of our three new parks because Nick's here to talk about the third. I want this to be as informal as possible. So if you have questions as you go, just raise your hand and, and I'll take them. Um, so if I can. Yeah. So we're talking specifically today about the three new parks that that came into DCNR State Parks hands uh, as part of the 2022-2023 budget uh, when Governor Wolf uh, enacted that. And they are the three parks, one uh, Bossburg Neck here in Wyoming County, Big Elk Creek in Chester County, and the Susquehanna River lands, which we were just talking about in York County. Um, we'll talk about each one specifically, but in totality, uh, the park and, and the budget in 2022-2023 provided DCNR $45 million for these three new uh, entities. Uh, total acreage of over 3,600 acres and 22 salary staff and 21 wage staff. That's pretty huge as far as getting a big complement uh, shift uh, in our favor. Usually, like we when we get a mandate, we don't get staff to go with it. In this case, we got the mandate for three parks, which was the biggest influx of parks we've had in many years, but we also got the staffing and the funding to go with it to allow us to, to do our job uh, and to manage those facilities properly. Uh, so we're going to start with Big Elk Creek and I'm gonna let Ella talk about that. So Big Elk Creek State Park located in Chester County is a total of 1,888 acres. Um, it is one of the three parks in the Ridley Creek State Park Complex, along with Ridley Creek State Park and White Clay Creek State Park. It was originally managed as a part of White Clay Creek due to a lack of funding, but once proper funding was obtained from the 2022 budget, it became its own entity. So starting back in 2012, DCNR, through the Conservation Fund, purchased the majority of the park from George Strawbridge for about $32 million. They did so using a series of grants from Mount Cuba Center in Delaware, Chester County, and the Commonwealth. It was purchased due to the need to conserve one of the last areas of natural land in southern Chester County. This area of the state has been subject to an urban sprawl and development, which is occurring right outside the park. The last section of the park, the Martin Tract, was purchased in late 2022 for around $754,300. As a part of the budget, there was also a complement increase of seven salaried staff and seven wage staff, which includes management, clerical, education, maintenance, and law enforcement. I'm going to step in there. Just I should have clarified at the beginning. So we received $45 million as part of the budget. That was for acquisition. That was for the initial staffing. It was for infrastructure improvements. Big Elk Creek was unique in that other than the smart track that Ella just mentioned, this was all already acquisitions that were made prior to that. So the, the millions of dollars that Ella just mentioned was pre the budget. So we were fortunate not to have to take a huge chunk of the budget of that $45 million for these land acquisitions. Yes. 
Yeah, okay, yep, good question. So all the white are in holdings. Uh, this one here is actually Mr. Strawbridge's last remaining part. He kept that for himself. And then we have these other three in holdings here. And if you're familiar with the area, you got two things. You got uh, people that are still farming, using it as farmland, or you have development, um, high-end housing developments right outside the park. So the landscape of Big Oak Creek includes rolling hills, fields, and forests. Here, visitors can partake in low-impact activities such as hiking, horseback riding, fishing, and deer hunting. Currently in the park, there is the Spring Lawn Trail, um, unofficial trails to Fair Hills Natural Resource Management Area in Maryland, two parking lots, ruins of farmhouses, historic mills, and three historic Mason-Dixon mile markers. There is currently a lot of work being done at this park to protect and restore the natural resources. This includes wetland protection, meadow conservation, floodplain restoration, and riparian buffer restoration. There has been a lot of progress made with the riparian buffer project. Um, over 70,000 native trees and shrubs have been planted in partnership with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. So Big Oak Creek is a tributary of the bay. Therefore, one of DCNR's goals is to improve the quality of Big Oak Creek to ensure the integrity of the bay. Uh, DCNR is also concerned about the cultural resources of the park, which includes the untold stories of the indigenous people and of the Underground Railroad. Um, as a step of bringing Big Oak Creek online, DCNR underwent a master planning process for this park. A public presentation of the preliminary report was later held in November of 2023. Since then, um, there has been additional engagement with local citizens and elected officials due to concern for any type of development. This map illustrates the conceptual master plan for Big Oak Creek. The plan includes new trails, additional parking, an educational and administrative building, uh, stream crossings, day use areas, a scenic overlook, and access roads. Um, as a result of the November 2023 public presentation, elements of this conceptual um, plan related to some development plans have been pulled, including overnight facilities. And any and all new amenities developed in the future will be accessible and inclusive. So I will just uh, reiterate, this was a conceptual plan that was shown at the public presentation in November. This isn't the plan moving forward. We're, we're undergoing a, a series of meetings with local state, local local partners and neighbors um, to, in a task force setting to try and develop and decide on what recommendations should move forward with with what, if any, development of Big Elk Creek State Park. So this isn't the plan. This was just a conceptual idea of what could be. Yes. Uh, in a higher water event, but not typically, at least not in this area of it. As of right now, overnight is off the table at this state park. Any other questions on Big Oak Creek? All right, well, I'll, I'll transition Maddie here to Susquehanna Riverlands, which is uh, near and dear to some of you. Susquehanna Riverlands is located in Hellam Township, York County, just six miles northwest of Wrightsville, PA. It's a part of a complex with Samuel S. Lewis and Susquehannock State Parks. And the park has a total of 1,044 acres and was purchased for $11 million in September of 2022. As a part of the budget complement increase, there will be eight full-time staff and nine seasonal staff, including management, administrative, law enforcement, maintenance, and education. The Susquehanna Riverlands landscape includes deciduous forest, cropland, mixed forest, evergreen forest, herbaceous rangeland, shrub and brush rangeland, and farmstead. The park features multiple rock outcrop vistas over the river and nearly a mile of riverfront along the Susquehanna, with one and a half miles along Codorus Creek. The current facilities include a parking lot, portable toilets, Historic buildings, such as the Iron Master's Mansion, pictured on the left. This building was formerly owned by James Smith, a signatory of the Declaration of Independence, and was built in the late 18th or early 19th century. 
cultural resources such as the Flint Mill Ruins Pictured Center and the Codorus Furnace constructed in 1837, which is currently owned by the Conservation Society of York County, but is in the process of being transferred to the Commonwealth and is pictured mm -hmm. on the right. The park also features an approximately 2.75 mile long portion of the Mason Dixon Trail. This is a 200 mile long trail that connects the Appalachian Trail at Whiskey Springs in Cumberland County with Chad's Ford along the Brandywine River. Similar to Big Elk Creek, Susquehanna Riverlands underwent a master plan process, resulting in three conceptual designs for the master plan. Here is one of the possible options. All three plans vary slightly, but include the following elements. Different trail options, such as variable surface, stabilized surface, and a multi-use trail. Buildings, including a visitor center, maintenance building, comfort station, and shower house. And around 70 total campsites, including standard, full service, group sites, walk-in sites, cottages, and yurts. All new facilities will be accessible and inclusive. So um, this this uh, the master planning process of Susquehanna Riverlands actually leapfrogged over uh, Big Elk Creek due to some of the uh, outcry that we received. We this is stale. We have the final public presentation next Wednesday. I'm not going to get out in front of that, but that that's actually going to be held. Uh, next Wednesday evening and that final presentation of what that final conceptual plan for that park is, is going to be released. Um, separate from from Big Elk, this one was met with a lot of, of uh, good good comments, good feedback. It's everything that's been proposed for the most part has, well, all of it has been been liked. There's been some tweaks that we had to make, um, but we have a lot of positive uh, momentum moving behind the state park. So that, that's a good thing for us moving forward. And then the last one, just just real quick, because Nick's going to get into the details. So Vosburg Neck, which most of you had the opportunity to visit yesterday and is a really cool park and, and certainly a, a great piece to add to our collection of state parks. Uh, almost 700 acres and was initially purchased by the North Branch Land Trust um, back in 2003 from Ernie Howland. And then we purchased it in December of 2022 um, from the North Branch Land Trust. Uh, with that part came a complement of some, seven salary staff, five seasonal staff, same, same job classes as the other two parks. Um, but again, tremendous resource running right through the middle of it. I think it's a halfway of the East Branch of the Susquehanna as well. Uh, so State Parks is the halfway of the AT and also the halfway of the East Branch of Susquehanna River. So that's, that's a cool thing. Um, there's just a, a map. Um, and there's a picture of the, the river at a very low time of the year. Does we'll save the Vosper questions for Nick, I think, unless it's a high level question you don't want to hit him with. Uh, but does anybody have any questions on Big Elk Creek or Susquehanna Riverlands? Go ahead. Sure, a little bit of what you said. Uh, off the table. Yeah. What does that mean? So, uh, there, there was a, a public outcry from a lot of local folks that didn't want to see uh, heavy use in a park that right now is pretty quiet. Um, doesn't have a, a main water feature other than Big Elk Creek, doesn't have that focal point, doesn't have that that aha moment where somebody like, this is where I want to go. It's not like a Ricketts Glen or something else has a Falls Trail, it has that main attraction. I think in the mind of a lot of folks in that area of the state, they want to keep it pristine, they want to keep it tranquil. They don't want to attract people to the area and disturb the natural element of it. I think a lot of education still needs to, to be understood about the value of bringing folks sure. into state parks. Uh, one of the reasons why we wanted overnight at, or we were looking at overnight at Big Elk was because once you get below French Creek State Park, there's not another state park overnight opportunity in the southeastern part of the state. Um, so 
to, to be able to move things forward, we took, we took it off the table, you know, you know, in the future, things could be evaluated, but we need to, to get back and work with the local partners to, to figure out what, what's most important and, and what works for everybody at this point in time. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't say that everybody is on, like you never have a hundred percent buy-in, but survey results, feedback of the, the public presentation that we had. We also had partner meetings as part of the the process uh, to to gain that feedback. We're talking a small seventy sites is not a lot um, in the area that is proposed at Susquehanna Riverlands, and I will tell you, I don't think it's that big of a spoiler alert. Um, I think that the camping area. In all three conceptuals, we're in the same area. It's it's a farm field right now that's already disturbed. Um, so seventy sites doesn't have a huge impact. It also isn't an area where it doesn't have any visual impacts. If you look, there, there's some great view sheds from that park. Um, those campgrounds are going to be able to see and have some of those great view sheds, but it's not going to affect if you. We're standing in this field and looked over here. There's a huge development that can see this field. They're not going to be able to see the campground. So a lot of that was taken into to consideration. Um, the other nice thing about Susquehanna Riverlands. We don't have a ton of, of neighbors right on the perimeter of the park. That's a big difference from Big Elk Creek. Um, any any impact or any development or any future use at Big Elk Creek is essentially right across the street from somebody's house. Here we have a few neighbors and we've been working with them to move our entrance road uh, in the future and things like that to try and accommodate them um, and not have an impact on them because they're, they're our partners, our neighbors. So uh, obviously their, their input is super important to what we do. But this entire stretch here, we don't have any neighbors. Right here we have neighbors, but this is an area that would be buffered from any type of development. So right now, so it's a good question. Where that parking area is here, we're, we're trying to advance some work in this area as a takeout for Cadoris Creek, which has white water. Um, and right now, I believe you can take out on this side, um, but then also a put in to go down the river. Cadoris Creek. I think so. Yeah. I see up to the left. Is that a subdivision that they were all along black lines? Right in here? Yeah. Yeah, that's a development. The topography there is it's a development coming down the hillside on the north side of Cadoris Creek. And then essentially, once you get past this road here, it goes back up and climbs. And the majority of the park in here is on a plateau overlooking the river and everything up here. I don't know that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, question in regards to the camping aspect of this. Mm -hmm. I know you're trying to modernize camping amenities, accessibility, and things of that sort. How are you approaching getting electricity into the site? Is there a consideration for like essentially solar EV assistance? And how that might fit into this project? Sure. So anytime we do any new infrastructure, we take a look at the sustainability. Any new building, part of the engineering process is to evaluate for solar. So that that's that's a given with any project. Um, where where the office visitor center is going to be located, that's it's a possibility on the building or we put solar fields at a lot of our locations. This, I'm, I'm not saying it, it will be, but this is a potential for a net zero park. Um, and then as far as camping goes, electric already does come to the site. So, you know, it, we're, we're just putting onto the grid there, but um, the, the utilities as far as electric are there, but we would take a look at any type of sustainability. Like you said, the, the charging stations, um, and usually our new visitor centers and offices take a look at at aspects of lead certification, maybe not getting certified, but but utilize aspects of lead to 
to try and, you know, talk the talk, yeah. walk the walk. Felt from the conceptual, but are you rerouting the Bates and Dixon through that area, or is it roughly the same? We have to come to the meeting. Uh, I no. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we uh, we are, and but we we've done that in in concert with the Mason Dixon Trail Club. Um, I think there's some give and take there, but you know they've they've been working with us hand in hand to the point where we've had multiple trips where that they and the local manager have things flagged in the woods of where we want things to go. Um, so they're they're aware too of where we want to put things because a trail needs to fit into the the grander scheme of things. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at doing here is having uh, an ADA trail to an ADA overlook that you can overlook the river. So um, yes, they've been involved and, and there are some minor, cha minor changes. If, if you're familiar with it now, it's right along a road. So it's not what you'd want the trail to be anyway, so. Uh, general question overall in your camping facilities, not just in these three parks, but across the system. Yeah. Are you seeing, I know, I'm sure demand is high post, like immediate post pandemic period. Is it maintaining that? Has it dropped off a little bit? I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's maintained. Like we've found a lot of users, whether it's overnight or not, that found us during the pandemic that have stuck with us. And as a user of state parks myself and, and having kids and not being able to plan 11 months in advance to get that reservation, it's still tough. Uh, so, you know, people have found our parks and they continue to go there, which is good. I, I think we're doing something right if that's the case. Um, but yeah, I, I think we're still getting some, some high demand. The assistant director doesn't get like a special gig. I don't know. <laughs> no, sir. So as as the footprint of Vosburg Neck is now, the answer is no. Um, when Nick talks about it, I think you'll see that the topography doesn't allow for it. Um, if future acquisitions may open that up, if if there ever is that opportunity, but the topography right now does not allow for it. You either have floodplain or or heavy terrain that would not make sense. Did I answer that right? Yeah. All right. Anything else? I'll say that I'm saying for lunch. So if you want to hit me with a question afterwards, uh, I'm I'm available. Okay. Thank you. Switch over to my PowerPoint, please. Well, thank you for uh, the introduction, Jason. And uh, I heard a lot of good feedback about the, the visitors to the park yesterday, so I'm glad you all had a really good time. Uh, <clears throat> just wanted to give you guys some some more updates on Vosburgh Next Day Park, uh, what we have currently, and then some of our future plans. Uh, so my name is Nicholas Salzer. I'm the park manager. Um, I've been with the Bureau for about 10 years now, a little over 10 years. Um, I started as a semi-skilled laborer and a park ranger uh, before moving on to the park management series. Um, I started out in Western Pennsylvania. I lived at Marine State Park for about three years, and I've worked in a number of those parks in the western side of the state. So very familiar with that side of the state as well. And then 2016, I moved back to this side of the state uh, as the assistant park manager of Hickory Run State Park. Um, got a ton of very good experience. It's an amazing resource down there. Um, before getting a position with Tuscarora and Locust Lake State Parks as a standalone manager. 
Um, I was there for a little over two years, I believe. Um, I had planned to be there for a number of years. I thought I might even retire from that park. Um, and then this position came available. And uh, one of my big loves with park management is some of the bigger picture thinking, some of the policy and the, the um, you know, design and stuff. So this opportunity was a, a once in a career opportunity uh, to take a position like this. And I just knew I had to put in for it. Um, and I was honored to be selected as the manager of Vosburg Next State Park. So uh, current amenities, what, what do we have there currently? Uh, pictured there is our boat launch. It's a hand launch only. Um, we uh, will get into a little bit later, but hoping to make some upgrades to that in the future. So what are our recreational opportunities? Uh, as Jason mentioned, you know, we're, we're going to be a day use park in our, in our current landscape. So we have hiking, biking, boating, hunting, fishing, picnicking, educational program, and, uh, wildlife watching opportunities. Uh, pictured there is, uh, one of our events where we had a number of people launching from the, the launch. So we have approximately eight miles of multi-use trails. Uh, the hand launch boat ramp, the Riverside Barn and event area, uh, small picnic areas, and currently non-flushable restroom facilities. Um, during North Branch's ownership of the, the area, uh, there was a friends group that formed the Friends of Howland Preserve. Um, the president and vice president, Allie and Doug Wilson, were both living on property. They continue to live on property in the Yellow House. But they were uh, helping to operate the park and maintain the park. Um, and so there was a partnership that was formed there. When we took over the property, we uh, maintained that partnership um, and we went into agreement with them. They rent out the Riverside Barn and the event area for different events, um, weddings, reunions, um, special events like the Conrack meeting. Uh, so it's a great partnership we have between them. And then they use it as a fundraising opportunity. So any money they generate from renting that out comes back into the park and certain projects. Um, I, I mentioned it a little bit to the, the visitors yesterday. Our partners and our stakeholders have been incredibly important to us. Um, in this position, more than any of my other positions, I have worked with this local community in such a high detail. Um, you know, our friends of Osberg Next Day Park, the North Branch Land Trust, Endless Mountain Visitors Bureau, Endless Mountain Heritage Region, the Public Library of Tunkanic, uh, Penn State Extensions Master's Programs, the Dietrich Theater. I could be here just for a while naming them. Uh, it's been incredible working with these partners. Uh, Amanda, my EES has, has gotten out into the community. She's partnered on programming. Uh, we've partnered on a number of volunteer projects within the state park. It's It's been incredible and extremely proud of my staff and the park for making those connections and, and how well we've done in the short time we've been a park. So some of the things we've done since we've become a state park, uh, we've planted over 500 trees. Um, there's a number of areas in the day use area that you'll see the, the blue tree tubes. Um, a lot of these areas were either heavily overrun with autumn olive and other invasive species, or they were mowed lawn areas that we've converted to reduced mowing and back to meadow habitat. Uh, invasive species removal, I would say we probably cleared close to five acres now of autumn olive, multi-floral rows and other invasives that uh, a lot of it's been through just manual removal techniques. Uh, trail improvements and signage. Uh, just this last month, we've got all of our trail signage up. Uh, we have a few uh, adjustments we need to make to that. Um, but we've done a lot of trail improvements, um, some areas where we had uh, standing water or very muddy areas. We've diverted water. Um, 
we've opened up, reopened up two trails in the park that had kind of overgrown and not been maintained to the level that they should have been. Um, the Eagle Trail and the uh, Canal Trail, which were both follow mainly on the old railroad grade uh, that goes through the park. So we were able to get them back opened up, uh, mostly through uh, volunteer days with our friends group and other volunteers. Um, I mentioned before, we've implemented reduced mowing plan and we've uh, converted probably an acre or two of mowed lawn back into you know, early successional habitat, which is, is great. Uh, we've had a, a number of volunteer days where we've, um, you know, this was all old farmland. Uh, so we've gone in some of those old farm dumps and, and removed um, hundreds of pounds of, of garbage and trash and metal. Um, just in the last two weeks, we've been working along the Susquehanna River. We removed 80 or 90 tires from the, the river and probably over 200 pounds of trash and metal from the, the river bank and, and the sandbar that travels along the river. Um, we got an educational programming up up and running. Uh, Amanda's been a rock star with that. She's gotten uh, from nothing to she's doing several programs a week. She's partnering with the library, the Dietrich, the Endless Mountain Heritage Region, mm -hmm. and providing quality programming to school groups, um, homeschool groups, and just the, the general public. And then we prefer, uh, have provided safety and law enforcement protection to the park. Um, you know, when we took over this, this park, we're a little bit different from the other two parks in that they were both part of a complex. Um, I like to joke around and say, you know, we didn't have a hammer to swing. We didn't have a garbage bag in the park. Uh, the friends group working with North Branch had done an amazing job on getting some trails up and running and some basic recreational amenities, but we didn't have the tools we needed off the get go to do the work that we needed to do. So there was a lot of planning involved, a lot of purchasing to, to get the tools we needed to do the work we do on a daily basis. And then moving into uh, some of the future visions, uh, what, what we would like to see in the park. Um, we will be building a park office and a maintenance facility. Um, we're kind of leaving the scoping of that and beginning design. Uh, that will hopefully include public restroom facilities. Uh, we have just porta potties at the current moment. So we'd like to see some flushable restroom facilities. Uh, we'd like to provide an educational classroom and some some more opportunities for Amanda to provide her programming and then some improved parking. And then we'd also like to see some boat launch improvements. Um, the section of river we are on is highly sought after for fishermen. Uh, unfortunately, upstream of us isn't any very good uh, motorized launches. And the one that's downstream of us, um, about a little under a mile downstream of us, there's a set of riffles and rapids that um, during low water, like it is right now, kind of prevents motorized boat access to our section of the river. So I think uh, improving our boat launch to allow that motorized access would um, greatly improve the access to recreation on that section of the river. We'd like to continue with our trail improvements, uh, provide increased access and parking in the park, um, and then continue with our invasive species removal and habitat improvement. Of course, this is our contact information. And does anyone have any questions for me? They're not, they're their own 5013C. Sir, trust um, how visitation has trended since, I mean, since this one was already a public preserve. Was um, designated a state park, did that trigger more people visiting it? So, so talking to uh, Allie and Doug, it's definitely gone up a little bit. Um, we started our visitor as estimate 
estimation back in June of last year. Um, in the off season, we were seeing anywhere between a thousand to two thousand estimated visitors to the park, and then during the summer season, we've been seeing between two and three thousand. Um, I think that's still a little light. I think once we get um, our office it's a little more uh, hard facilities there, we'll see another kind of spike in attendance, and uh, I think we'll see a little bit more than that. But that's where we've been at so far. Do you get a sense from? either speaking to park users or the community, are people, like when they come to Bosford Neck, is Tom Kanemick sort of their gateway community to the park where they're like, getting food or going to have to eat or getting paid? Or are people traveling, are they benefiting? Do you think Tom Kanemick's benefiting from some of the things? So, so from the people I've, I've interacted with, I would say a large majority of them have been locals to the community. Um, we have seen people coming from out of state. We even have some people from Canada and stuff that, you know, they heard about new park being brought in. So there are people that are definitely coming from pretty far away to just targeting the park. And, you know, they're, they're definitely using the, the local surrounding community for food and, you know, staying overnight and stuff. That's great. Uh, Jason, do you? <laughs> I mean, I, I biggest one of the biggest things we've done at at the park, just in general, has you know just gone knocking on doors and and making those connections. Um, you know, working with the the visitors bureau and and getting some of our you know our literature out there has been big. Um, we we. So, I guess I'll. Start. <laughs> I mean, there there was a there was a heavy press release and and media push when it happened. There's also a fine line. You don't want to invite all the people to the park that doesn't have the heart and facilities to support that either. So, I think over time, each of these three parks was was unique and and how they were brought about and what they have to offer. I think Nick mentioned this. Like as as we get a, a visitor center and office here, I think we'll start pushing a little bit more. There was there was the initial push. And then, you know, we got an educator and staff. So now Amanda's getting out there in a the community. I, I think we don't want drones of people right away with the, the current setup that we have. Like, I think it's gradual and building over time. Um, I think once we, we get a visitor center, then there'll be more of a, a push in marketing for that. Um, and again, like Nick said, we rely a lot on partners and maybe not just to push the park, but here's an opportunity while you're in the area to partner with us and do this or do that. I will say that, you know, my perception of the surrounding community is that we've been overwhelmingly positive uh, feedback. Um, <clears throat> very few negative comments. Almost everyone I talk to is super happy to have us here and um, you know, it's for a new part and in new areas and how the community is going to interact with you. But it's been it's been great to work with the community. And like I said, it's been overwhelmingly positive. So community relates to potentially offering or maybe we're just receiving this information at the moment, but uh, motorized boat traffic on that section of the river. I, I can imagine that individuals that are like blackfish and green and maybe some thoughts around that. I haven't had any negative. I, I know a lot of people that are heavy fishermen of that area would love to see that access. <clears throat> I would we we're kind of planning on with the office build. Hopefully it's part of that, but you know, with budgets and everything it, that could change. Nick, building up so that you talk about improved access and you talk about motorized access. Motorized access we were hoping to get. All right. I will also be around at lunch. So if you have any more questions for me, feel free to Touch base with me. Thank you.
All right. Thanks, Nick. And we just wanted to reiterate, too, last evening we had Senator uh, Lisa Baker with us, and she just spoke about, again, her excitement. Um, having the first state park in Wyoming County is huge from her perspective. Um, obviously, there is a feasibility study that really laid the groundwork for creating the park, and Senator Baker was involved with that. So just wanted to give her a shout out for really championing the whole park creation process along with state parks and the legislature and the governor's office at the time. Um, okay, so now we'll welcome Jill Robinson. Uh, she's deputy director from for the Endless Mountain Visitors Bureau, and she's also spent a bunch of hours with us recently. So thanks for so much of your time, Jill, for the last couple of days. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me. We are really excited to have you here in the Endless Mountains. Talking to people last night, it sounds like you had a great time on your excursions, so we're really happy to hear that. Uh, today, I just want to give you a sense of where we are, what we have to offer, and also why it's a really exciting time, not just here in the Tunkhannock area, but also uh, for PA tourism and, and outdoor recreation as a whole. So uh, what are the Endless Mountains? So the region as a whole is Bradford, Sullivan, Susquehanna, and Wyoming counties. So that's represented by our heritage region and Kane Chamberlain does amazing work um, with that. They're actually doing a feasibility study right now to try to make a national heritage area. So that would be such a game changer for us. Uh, my agency, is specifically with Wyoming and Sullivan counties. Uh, so where does the name come from? It, all, it dates all the way back to the 1750s. They found a map that a very young George Washington carried with him to the Ohio Territory. And everything above Philadelphia and the Lehigh Valley area was just labeled Endless Mountains because that's what it was to them back in the day. So uh, as you, you can see in that top map there, uh, you know, Philadelphia, we have endless mountains. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we were formed, my agency was formed in the 60s, and they really embraced that because we still do have that kind of wilderness experience and that historic experience. So some places in our region that you may have heard of or may have visited already, uh, Loyal Stock State Forest, out in Sullivan County, as well as the Loyal Sock Trail, which is about 60 miles of backpacking trail uh, with the Alpine Club of Williamsport. Ricketts Glen State Park, we were joking last night that uh, three different counties claim Ricketts Glen State Park, but it, it's that big of a park. Everyone knows that for the Falls Trail, and that is definitely a bucket list hike that I would recommend. It's 21 waterfalls in one seven, mile trail system so uh, but there is so much more to that park as well to explore um, i would definitely check that out uh, world's end state park is also out in sullivan county uh, right next to the loyal sox state forest that's an amazing park because there are so many overlooks in there so it's down in the valley and no matter where you go you have to go up uh, and of course that means beautiful views there and then, of course, the Susquehanna River, uh, named 2023 River of the Year. Uh, those who experienced the float yesterday got to see, I know I'm biased, but I do think it is one of the prettiest stretches of the river. So why outdoor recreation? This is a stat that you've probably seen, but the outdoor industry contributed about $17 billion to PA's GDP in 2022 which is huge. Uh, like Commissioner um, King was saying yesterday, it is a big chunk of our economy. Uh, so now I think people are starting to realize it's more than just something fun that we do on weekends or hobbies. It really does have an impact uh, on our local economies. So for us, we're a rural destination. We don't have resorts. We don't have water parks or shopping malls, but we really rely on the parks, the trails, the campgrounds, 
And I think that's true for a lot of rural counties in Pennsylvania, that they have the same situation. Uh, we actually really benefited from the renewed interest in outdoor recreation after COVID. So during COVID, our overnight stays really stayed the same because people wanted to just rent a cabin in the woods and be alone and enjoy nature. So we are really excited that people are rediscovering these places. And of course, it just improves the quality of life for residents and the tourists as well. So it just makes it a really desirable place to live, work, and play. So I know we've we've given a, a good overview of, of some of these places, but I just want to share why this is so important. Uh, we had two really uh, amazing milestones here in Wyoming County, Bosberg Neck being our first state park and Miller Mountain being our first state forest land. And that happened in a period of about 14 months. So that was really wild to see that happen. Um, yeah, that's over 3,000 acres of land that became uh, state land. And that was really exciting for our community. Um, but why does it matter? Uh, as as Senator said last night, we were one of only four counties that didn't have a state park. And that's wild because we have so much beautiful land here and we are a rural county. So uh, that was really exciting for us. Also, Vosburg Neck has so much history, culture and geologic importance uh, to it. Uh, I also have to mention, um, because I sit on North Branch Land Trust Board, it was really important to fulfill Ernie Howland's dream of making it uh, he said in his last will and testament that he wanted it to be a county or state park. So 20 years later, uh, we did fulfill that for him. Uh, first park with the conservation easement and um, beautiful access to the river and trails, as Nick described. Uh, Miller Mountain, I'm so glad you all got to see Miller Mountain. Um, I'm glad you didn't have to hike up it because it's really <laughs> difficult. Uh, but uh, it is a local landmark to Tunkhannock. It is that peak that you see no matter where you are in town. And I think that's what made it special to so many local people. Uh, it's also unique that it's an entire mountain, not just a, a piece of it, but the whole landscape. And it, it really did, I think, have strong community support. I work with a a group called Com Community Heart and Soul here. It's a nationwide model, but uh, we bring it here to Wyoming County. So it's a resident-driven community planning program. We spent, we spent three years surveying and polling and talking to people about what they wanted to see in their community. And I swear every single event we went to, people said, make Miller Mountain public. <laughs> it's It's been on the public's mind for a long time. So I know people are really excited about it. And I think it fills the void for that intermediate to advanced level outdoor enthusiasts. Um, for, it's, it's tough hiking, as you can imagine. Also, uh, the Endless Mountains Gravel Bike Packing Loop, which Janet was referencing earlier, this was created just after the pandemic in a partnership between all the regional visitors bureaus, the heritage region and Northern tier regional planning and development. So what it is, it's about 430 miles long through all four counties on existing dirt roads and trails. So it was, um, it wasn't like we had to create anything new there, just kind of finding what the best routes were. Um, it, it matters because, uh, well, the person who came up with it was a former Sullivan County Commissioner who was an avid cyclist, Donna Iannone. And she said, hey, this gravel cycling is such a big thing out west, but we have so many dirt roads here. Why can't we do it here? So now people don't have to fly out west to have great gravel riding. They can come right here two or three hours from Philadelphia and New York. Uh, and like Janet mentioned, we are having a, we're calling it the Endless Mountains 430 Challenge on September 21st. People can race or tour it. So if you are a cyclist, I would definitely recommend checking that out. 
And uh, just some final thoughts. I think it is such an exciting time for these outdoor towns like Tunkhannock uh, because we're growing what we already have and investing in new opportunities. Um, and also we have this new state tourism brand. So you may have seen the Pennsylvania, the Great American Getaway was launched around Memorial Day, just in time for vacation. Uh, that's really exciting. There's a lot of things still in flux with it as we find out what the new brand all entails. But we do know that they are going to put an emphasis on outdoor fun and on small towns. And that benefits a lot of small communities like us. Uh, I do have, I'm going to hand out this publication. We do this in partnership with the Heritage Region and um, the other tourism bureaus in the area, but it's our outdoor recreation guide. So someone had a question about marketing. Uh, this is kind of our uh, how we contribute to that. It lists the parks and trails and campgrounds. We do 100,000 of these. So this is the second edition that we just did this uh, summer. The first one came out during right after COVID. Um, so I'll hand out those. Inside, there's a little insert about from North Branch Land Trust about how that transition over to the state park happened and why that's unique. Um, but that is all I have. I'll take any questions. And I do have my contact info up there. If you ever are interested in coming back to the area, if you just want to talk trails, I'm glad to do that. But any questions? All right, I will, I'll pass some of these out then. Yeah. <laughs> right. Is there any promotional material that you can share out? I'd love to like push that out. Sure. I know we have a, a Facebook event page. I don't have um printed, but I can send you the link to the there's a landing page and the the registration page. Okay. I'll make sure to, to get in touch. Okay. Great. Thank you. Oh, and a real question. Are you uh, in touch with our officers of our Outline you know, I have kind of lost my contact there. I think I had someone and I kind of lost them. I remember. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. I have these. All right. Thank you, Jill. Um, we are in a situation where we're ahead of schedule for once. It's kind of amazing. Um, but we will now open up our second public comment period, just in case there's been any public comment received. I don't believe we have in the chat. Okay. Uh, so no public comment. I guess we'll move forward to... Adjourn. Oh, Jerry's got something. Good. I'd just like to uh, make people aware that uh, our uh, Susquehanna Greenway partnership, the Sequenza County nonprofit, will be conducting an outdoor expo at the Chickalemi State Park Marina August 3rd, 10 until 3 p.m. And it gets a lot of uh, different uh, exhibitors. Uh, there's a uh, there's several companion events during that time. Uh, there will be a total of uh, opportunities for people to kayak. There'll be rentable kayaking uh, there, arts and crafts. Uh, there'll be gear uh, vendors and uh, workshops. And how to do uh, various outdoor activities, uh, paddling basics, tuning up your bicycle, kids' bike rodeo, rodeo and on water safety instruction. So it's it's quite a range of, of informative activities. And our Susquehanna Greenway partnership is also involved in cleaning up along the river and along trails. And in our spring cleanup, we picked up 40,000 pounds of trash, trails, and river walk and river. 
Excellent. Thanks, Jerry. Anything else for the good of the order? Oh. Oh, uh, okay, Nate, um, you can unmute and offer a public comment. She'll help you with that. She's finding you. Should be good. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Nate Regal, and I would just like to uh, to bring up an opportunity that I, I think DCNR can embrace. Um, given the Conservation and Natural Resources Act and the language in there regarding ecological resources and the recent House bills 2470 and 2471 regarding uh, invertebrate, native terrestrial invertebrate conservation and DCNR's potential role. I think that uh, this is a, a great opportunity and I urge DCNR to lean into the opportunity and be a leader in natural resource conservation and to make uh, invertebrate conservation a priority for the department. And uh, that concludes my comment. All right, thank you, Nate. Any other comments or good of the order items? All right, Bob, I forgot to use this on the way in. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Uh, there you go. <laughs> thank you, everybody.